But we wanted to start off this session by having you consider um, what percentage of tree canopy cover does your community currently beginning here? Um, please do not cheat. And if you're a forester or you work in community forestry, please do not look up your uh, tree canopy plan um, or look at any other data sources. If you could just guess based on your experience of what, what percentage of tree canopy anecdotally you think your community might have, you could pop that in the chat and say what community that is referring to. So it could be a community that you live in, that you work for, that you represent. Um, the chat function should be open. Um, so feel free to pop that into the chat when you have a chance. Um, we're going to give it a couple minutes since people are still joining. Um, but those of you who are logging on, please try to uh, address that first question, the trivia question. And we will provide answers at the end um, based on this new tool. So super exciting. The other thing is that the chat function should be used for comments regarding the presentation and questions for the presenters. Um, and questions, um, we would ask that questions are either saved until, um, until the end of the presentation or are popped in the chat. So um, we will have uh, moderators that will be collecting those questions that are in the chat function and we'll be returning to those at the end during Q&A. Um, if we have a lot of questions and we can't get to them all, we will be sending you responses in a separate correspondence after the meeting. So we'll try to get to all those questions. And I see some of the trivia responses are coming in um, to question number one, which is exciting. We've got St. Paul, I guess at 20% tree canopy, Burnsville, 65%, Chanhassen, 50%. Again, these are great guesses, and we're going to provide the answers at the end. So those of you who are just tuning in, if you want to try to guess the tree canopy coverage for your given community, that could be a community you work for or a community you live in or spend time in, if you could pop that in the chat. I will say, though, that the responses to that trivia question will be focused only on the metro, the Twin Cities metro region. So those of you who live and work in greater Minnesota, I apologize, but we will not have the answers to those questions. This is only for the seven county metro. I wanted to mention too that this, this session um, is eligible for um, uh, uh, CM credits uh, through uh, the American uh, Planning Association. So. If you are a certified uh, planner, um, you can get up to three CM credits for this uh, session, which is one hour session. That includes one equity and one sustainability um, credit this session. And we'll provide details on how to log those credits at the end of the session as well. So stick around for that. OK. We've got an answer from Pittsburgh, which is exciting, not within the Twin Cities Metro, but um, great to see those guesses. It's nice to see some people that are tuning in from other states as well. Um, we've got a guess here, Woodbury 25%. Again, those of you who are just tuning in, if you can try to pop the percentage of tree canopy for your community into the chat, and that should be a guess. We don't want you to cheat on this. so. It's what, what, you think the, what you think that percentage might be, and we're going to provide the answers at the end using this new tool. I think given that we're nearly 5 past 12, we can probably get started. What do you think, Ellen? You think we should launch into it? Great. Feel free to keep popping those questions in there. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I'll launch us off. And I do apologize if my dog barks a little bit. It's that time of day, so it's a virtual environment. We're just going to have to deal, deal with that. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eric Wycheck. I'm a planning analyst in the local planning assistance work unit in community community development at the Metropolitan Council. I welcome you to this Planet webinar, uh, which is hosted by the Met Council. And I'm here today with Ellen Ash, senior data scientist in the research work unit, also within community development at the Metropolitan Council. We'll be co-presenting on this new tool called Growing Shade. Uh, Growing Shade is a tree planting, canopy enhancement, and preservation tool. And like I said either, uh, earlier, if you can hold your questions either towards the end or pop those questions in the chat, we'll be collecting those. So we'll be returning to those at the Q&A. And as I said earlier, those of you just tuning in, 
This uh, session is eligible for three CM credits uh, through the American Planning Association, and we'll be providing details on how to log those credits at the end. Um, we are very excited about this tool. Um, it's, it's, I think it's a game changer. It's really going to be exciting to see planners uh, and uh, community staff and foresters working um, to enhance our tree canopy. And this tool really makes that a lot easier in terms of getting those numbers and generating the data that's needed. Next slide, please. So for this session, we're going to we're going to explain where this project came from and how it connects to the Metropolitan Council's re regional policy role. Following this, we're going to discuss tree planting and canopy preservation as a sustainable solution to intersecting regional issues. We are also provide some background for the tool, including stakeholder needs. And then Ellen's going to demonstrate the tool and the various applications of it. And then we'll finish with a discussion of ongoing training efforts and continued outreach. And then we're going to provide some answers to your trivia questions at the end. Uh, next slide, please. So to provide a high level, some high level context, uh, the Metropolitan Council started uh, engaging in regional tree canopy work in as early as 2015. Um, but uh, with the adoption of our regional development guide, Thrive MSP 2040, uh, this, this tree canopy work was really enshrined within that policy document and it directed us to do more work in this area. So that's kind of the early genesis of this project. Next slide, please. It can be argued that tree canopy planting enhancement and preservation spans all of these five thrive outcomes of stewardship, prosperity, equity, livability, and sustainability. But we're really going to focus here on two outcomes that really form the foundation of this project, and that's sustainability and equity. Thrive MSP 2040, which is that regional policy guide that guides the Twin Cities metro region, um, defines sustainability as protecting our regional vitality for generations to come. And trees play a big role in sustainability because a single tree is an expression of policy that can span several human generations. In addition, we need to recognize that land use, environmental and climate change policies affect groups differently. This project centers environmental justice considerations in the stories and interactive tool. Environmental justice is achieved when everyone enjoys the protection from environmental and health hazards. And Ellen's gonna explain this in a lot more detail. Next slide, please. This slide provides a high level summary of the information we wish to convey today, namely the purpose of the tool, which is to pro provide an interactive resource to inform tree canopy planting enhancement and preservations within the Twin City preservation within the Twin Cities region. Uh, this tool responds to a need expressed by key stakeholders. Uh, practitioners have limited resources and capacity, and this tool can help deliver a multitude of benefits for residents most in need. The tool includes stories from on the ground practitioners and advocates. And the tool is highly customizable and provides up to date information, which is critical given the challenge, given challenges such as climate change. The project is a collaboration between the Met Council, the Minnesota Nature Conservancy and the Minnesota nonprofit Tree Trust. The project is ongoing and there will be training and outreach opportunities throughout the coming months. Next slide, please. And now I'm going to pass it over to Ellen to explain how trees intersect with many regional issues. Thanks. Great, thanks for providing that policy context for the project, Eric. And as Eric alluded to, now I'll describe the intersectionality between trees and regional issues. So throughout the course of developing Growing Shade, we took a close look at four key issues that intersect with the tree canopy. And those issues are environmental justice, climate change, conservation of natural resources, and public health. So briefly, we know that trees are not distributed e evenly around the region, and that certain groups disproportionately face negative consequences of land use decisions. And these facts underlie the overlap between trees and environmental justice. Climate change is another big issue facing our region. With rising temperatures and altered precipitation patterns, Trees and other green infrastructure can be useful in mitigating some of these impacts. 
Trees also provide valuable benefits of sequestering carbon and providing habitat for biodiversity. Preserving the existing tree canopy and considering the value of natural resources in making land use decisions can help our region grow and change sustainably into the future. And then finally, we also know that trees are linked to better health of people. Trees improve both air and water quality and are also linked to improve physical and mental health of residents. So growing the tree canopy can help improve public health. And the map that you're seeing on the right of this screen, it's showing the relevance of these four key issues across our region. The colors are indicating the highest priority issue in each census block group. And this map is an overview and local level issues may be different or need a more tailored focus. Growing Shade does allow for full customization and in-depth exploration of issues, which I'll get into soon, but please remember that stakeholder engagement is also critical. Given that broad overview, now I'll share some of the history behind this overlap and provide some recent data that shows how these issues actually play out on the ground. So the first thing to consider is that in our region and across the nation, racist policies and history have impacted today's environmental conditions. In our region, systematic seizure of indigenous land and genocide occurred as Dakota and Ojibwe people were coerced into signing land session treaties beginning in 1805. Within Growing Shade, we invite you to learn more with a perspective from the native-led Lower Failing Creek Project. This group is using trees to help restore the Wakan Teepee site in St. Paul. And while 200 years, which have passed since the early 1800s, spans multiple human generations, that history is easily recorded within the lifetime of a single tree. And for me, this fact really makes poignant the profound impact that racist policies and history have had in influencing today's environmental conditions. Black communities have also been disproportionately exploited and impacted by land use decisions and policy. Redlining was a government sanctioned practice across the nation that started in the 1930s. And the maps on the right of this screen are showing which areas were redlined in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And of course, redlining doesn't apply to um, all areas in our region, but the intentionality of excluding black families from home ownership and denying access to capital in predominantly black neighborhoods was widespread. So even with the end of redlining, racially restrictive housing covenants continued until the 1950s. Redlining has lasting consequences today, including lower tree canopy in these areas. Creating infrastructure also last, left lasting negative consequences on minority communities with black residents, and businesses being displaced as I-35W and I-94 were constructed. Today, this leaves Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color disproportionately impacted by lack of trees and green space and having higher land cover of impervious surfaces. Pollutants from vehicle exhaust also bring respiratory health issues to communities situated along these interstates. In Growing Shade, a story from St. Paul's Frogtown neighborhood explores these issues and that group's initiative to plant trees to help promote a more equitable future. So in summary, all of these racist policies have lasting consequences, and it's why environmental justice is a key issue identified by this project. Of course, these issues are not unique to our region, nor is this a comprehensive list of environmental justice issues. It is encouraging to see researchers and media outlets start to uncover these stories nationally. We're really pleased to add Growing Shade to the mix and want to highlight that our project more precisely focuses in on our region's unique history in a way that generalized national trends or tools cannot. So with that background, here are the data for our region which show disparities in tree canopy cover with income and race. In these plots, each of the roughly 2000 census block groups across the seven county region are plotted. So the panel on the left is showing that tree canopy increases sharply with household income up until the median annual income of an area is around $100,000. The panel on the right is showing that tree canopy decreases as the share of residents identifying as a person of color gets higher. And do note that these figures are showing tree canopy cover in 2021. So we're not talking history here. These are the conditions occurring on the ground today. To provide a bit of context for these numbers, here I've pulled up two examples. So on top, you can see an area from St. Paul's Summit Hill neighborhood. This area has 42% tree canopy cover, a median household income of about $120,000, 
and 9% of residents identify as a person of color. The other example is from Minneapolis's Camden neighborhood. This area has less than half the tree canopy of Summit Hill. This area also has half the median income and six times more residents identify as a person of color. Interestingly, these two areas share the same population density of about 13 people per acre, so this is not a density or space issue here. The inequities in tree canopy cover mean consequences and temperatures is land temperatures is one of those consequences um, here. So in 2017, an extreme heat tool was part of the climate vulnerability assessment for the region. The extreme heat tool shows differences of up to 40 degrees in land surface temperatures during a 2016 heat wave, and that's shown in the map at right. Now these temperature differences have several key drivers. The shading from trees and evaporative cooling from all vegetation can help reduce temperatures. Impervious surfaces and the heat generated from human activities. So here, think about running vehicle engines or air conditioning units that can contribute to heat islands, which drive up temperatures in urban areas. Taking steps to reduce land temperature is important because extreme heat is deadly and adding trees can help reduce heat related deaths. Granted, the research hasn't been done in our area, but in Baltimore, which is in Maryland, they had a study done recently and they showed that the existing tree canopy already prevents about 550 deaths each year in their city of 620,000 people. So if our region of 3.2 million people saw a proportionally similar impact, that would mean over 2,700 premature deaths prevented just from trees alone. So growing the tree canopy and reducing tree inequity could prevent more premature deaths. Vulnerability to extreme heat, in addition to considering variables related to the impact that trees can have on respiratory, physical, and mental health, is considered in Growing Shade's public health lens. And finally, climate change underscores the urgency of acting on extreme heat. On average, the Twin Cities currently have 13 days each year with temperatures over 90 degrees. By 2050, we could see an additional 40 days over 90 degrees. The climate change lens in Growing Shade considers the impact of extreme heat and identifies areas most at risk from climate change hazards. The climate change lens also considers the risk of localized flooding, which trees can help mitigate via improved water infiltration. As for some data, this is what the relationship between summer land surface temperatures during a heat wave and the amount of green space looks like for our region. Here you can see the areas with high amounts of green space, including trees, they remain. Here again are the Camden and Summit Hill examples. So the Camden area has less green space and land temperatures were around 97 degrees during the heat wave. The Summit Hill area with more green space had land temperatures of about 94 degrees during that heat wave. And this is only a difference of three degrees in land surface temperature. But remember that a whole suite of other factors influence how humans are impacted by heat. So the combination of temperatures, humidity, dew point, and air quality can all make the difference of a few degrees feel much larger. The difference of a few degrees across the entire summer, not just during a heat wave, can also mean it's more costly for people to cool their residences for instance, by running air conditioning units, if people even have access to them. So not only may the total cost of electricity be higher, but given the lower incomes we see in Camden, that cost will be proportionally a much larger percent of people's total household income, which is now dedicated to utility bills. So you can see how this can keep spiraling into a feedback loop where low income and residents of color are continuously left with disproportionately high burdens across the board. As a quick aside, it's not going to be a good solution to make top down decisions to plant trees in these neighborhoods. There's a lesson from Detroit, Michigan, where the city tried that. But importantly, no one asked residents what their opinions were. There's no plan for providing maintenance for the trees, no plan for involving residents and thinking about which tree species they might prefer. And the project was not a success. So while the data on trees and inequities are powerful, stakeholder engagement is also critically important. And you'll see this continually emphasized in growing shade. Earlier, I mentioned the impact of redlining on green space and temperature. 
Across St. Paul and Minneapolis, areas with the A grade, the grades being shown here on the Y axis, those areas are cooler during heat waves today. Areas formally graded C or D, D corresponding to redlined areas, those areas are hotter today. And the points that you're seeing in this plot show the land temperatures during the 2016 heat wave, with the gray line in the middle showing the average temperatures of these areas. This plot shows how past policy has ramifications today, and hopefully you're starting to understand that shade trees have the potential to be an important tool for changing these trajectories. The final issue that I'm going to describe in more detail is the conservation of natural resources. So by now, hopefully you're all convinced that planting new trees can be helpful, but growing shade means so much more than just planting new trees. It also means preserving existing mature trees so that they can continue to grow and provide benefits. Unsurprisingly, mature trees offer more benefits than young trees. It takes time for trees to establish large enough canopies to provide shade. And mature trees store more carbon, and mature forests are more biodiverse and have bigger benefits on air and water quality. Our forestry partners highlight that getting trees to have trunks that are at least 18 inches in diameter is critical. As for what a tree that big looks like, a tree that's 18 inches in diameter takes roughly my full wingspan to hug. A growing trees to maturity and conservation of mature trees is often harder than planting new trees. Weekly watering of young trees is needed to help them establish. Dead trees certainly don't provide any community benefits and moreover can be an eyesore and a safety hazard. Speaking of dead trees, uh, emerald ash borer is an invasive insect which has or will kill every ash tree in our region without intervention. And some of you folks from uh, areas outside of the Twin Cities metro region are likely familiar with this particular invasive species um, as well as others that can threaten the tree canopy. EAB, or emerald ash borer, in our region has resulted in the removal of thousands of mature ash trees. So it's certainly worth considering that, where practical, it could make a big difference to, imply, to apply insecticides to keep mature trees in place, particularly in areas which already have low canopy cover. Finally, new developments and suburbanization also threaten the health of existing trees and forests. And this is why we have the conservation lens and growing shade to provide a way to consider the importance in, of conservation and management of the existing tree canopy. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Eric to um, explain a little bit about the stakeholder engagement. Thanks so much, Ellen. Uh, I'll now take you through some high level information that guided the project. As all of you know, as planners, uh, to create a useful tool you first need to demonstrate need for the tool. So that was, an, that was the first stage of this project, essentially, was to make sure that foresters and tree advocates um, were, were inputting into this, this project to make sure that there was a demonstrated need for a tool like this. Next slide, please. In early 2021, the Tree Trust and the Nature Conservancy carried out a survey of forestry practitioners in the Twin Cities metro region. They received 23 responses from a diverse range of community and county staff. This slide shows the three most common considerations in tree planting and maintenance. And this shouldn't be a surprise to most of you who either work in canopy planning or, or forestry. Uh, the, first, the, the top three considerations are replacing re, re, removed trees, uh, uh, planting for increased diversity, and addressing canopy gaps. Next slide, please. However, we asked the practitioners what they would like to start considering when it comes to tree canopy planting and maintenance. Respondents stated that they want to start planting in underserved areas where a lack of tree canopy can really exacerbate things like urban heat, lack of biodiversity, pollution, and health issues. Next slide, please. Also important, uh, the survey respondents express an interest in a tool that can generate reports, uh, provide prioritization features, and illustrate how various issues interact with tree canopy planning. Next slide, please. Beyond the survey in early 2021, we also formed an advisory group to help guide us in scoping and developing the tool. 
This group consisted of participants from academic institutions, state agencies, city and county forestry, neighborhood advocates, and nonprofit practitioners who work in the tree space. Six focus group areas emerged from the advisory group. Namely, they wanted to incorporate neighborhood level voices within the tool. And their focus really was on making sure that stories were being told and that qualitative data was also an important part of this tool. They wanted a tool that could provide up-to-date data to aid in the decision-making process. They wanted to ensure ease of access and clarity. They wanted to provide data reports and customizable features at multiple scales. And they wanted to ensure that audiences are varied and diverse and that that data should be actionable. So you can see from this list that it's kind of a tall order. And I think that we managed to achieve um, this, this wish list through the creation of this tool. Next slide, please. Once we had incorporated the early survey and advisory needs into a beta or draft version of the tool, including the stories, it was time to test these out on stakeholders. With the help of a University of St. Thomas marketing class, we administered a survey in November of 2021. We received 44 responses to the survey, and these were really helpful in determining if we were on the right path, if the tool was fit for purpose, and if the stories were sufficiently compelling. The feedback we received was really helpful in honing our message, enhancing accessibility and clarity of the tool, and demonstrating that we were largely fulfilling the need that had been expressed. Minor refinements and revisions were incorporated in December 2021 and January 2022. Next slide, please. Informed by our stakeholders and refined through testing, Growing Shade is a project of two key components. The first component of the project is stories, which educate about the considerations related, relating to growing shade. Um, and here you have a list of the different stories within the project. Uh, the first one being Frogtown Green, which focuses more on equity and environmental justice. We have Laura Phelan Creek Project, which focuses on an indigenous perspective. The Washington Conservation District story focuses on conservation and climate change. We have Brooklyn Center Community Schools, which looks at uh, education and extreme heat. And then we have Tree Trust, which focuses on tree maintenance and green infrastructure. Next slide, please. The second component of the project is a mapping tool with prioritization and reporting functions. The mapping tool is fully customizable and creates data-driven reports at the city, neighborhood, or individual census block group level. These reports can be downloaded for easier sharing. Next slide, please. So in essence, and in summary, uh, Growing Shade is filling a key gap. It's exciting because it's fully customizable. It has a laser focus on the issues and the intersecting issues in our region. It's highly actionable and it provides up-to-date data. Next slide, please. And now for the exciting part of our presentation, we're gonna actually take you through the tool and uh, I'll have Ellen start to bring that up. And uh, we're gonna start with the landing page, which starts, starts you out looking at the stories. So we'll, we'll kind of go through those quickly and then move on to the tool itself. So Eric, do you want to walk us through the stories? Yeah, we'll start with the, so this is a landing page. Um, you can see the three partners up at the top left corner there, the Metropolitan Council, Tree Trust, and Nature Conservancy. And as Ellen starts to scroll down, we, we enter pretty much straight away into the story portion of the tool. Um, like I said, this tool consists of the two components of stories and the mapping tool. Um, you can see at the top that there's a series of themes and those connect each to the stories. So there's five five stories and five themes. You can see those at the top. You could jump right to those if you wanted to do that. And as you scroll down, you see the first one is this Frogtown Green story. The nice thing with these stories is that they they um tell this they, they really raise the voices of practitioners that are working at different scales and on different uh on different issues related to tree canopy. Um, here you have some interactive uh, tools that you can look at to, to see the relation in this case between race and canopy cover. 
um, and you can even scroll out or scale this up if you wanted to, to look at this map on a regional scale. Um, so you've got these inset, some of these inset tools that you can play around with, um, along with diagrams as you start to scroll down. The next uh, story is the Lower Phelan Creek project story. And this one includes um, some really great perspective from um, the environmental justice coordinator, coordinator at that project. And you have a diagram here at the right that you, you can click on that and enhance it, make it a little bigger. This is showing how they're using uh, cottonwood trees to clean a uh, contaminated, uh, contaminated site. Uh, as you continue to scroll down, you've got the Washington Conservation District story. Here's a nice slider tool where you can actually see uh, through an aerial uh, the issue of um, natural resource fragmentation through development. Um, this is something that uh, we're seeing a lot in our region, certainly. Um, kind of paints that picture of the difference between 2002 and 2021 here. We're losing some forested land. As you scroll down further, some other diagrams and resources. Um, you've got the Brooklyn Center Community Schools story. And this one includes a nice slider tool showing the relation between the canopy and extreme extreme heat. We know we know that relationship, but it's kind of nice to actually see it um, in this data format where you can actually see where there's lack of canopy. There's there's hotter, a hotter result. Um, if you keep going down further, you've got the tree trust uh, story, which focuses on tree maintenance. And um, this diagram is really great. The why trees are so cool. Um, basically talks about all the, the benefits that trees provide, especially mature trees. Um, the tree trust was really um, instrumental in, in providing a lot of support and uh, subject matter expertise on this project. And then as you go down, you start to enter the framing out of the tool itself. What can the tool do? What are the different presets for the tool? Um, this is where that we can start to talk about how the, the tool itself can aid in decision-making processes. Um, so I'll pass it back over to Ellen. Great, thanks, Eric. And the next component, which is what I'll lead you through, is this mapping tool component. Um, so here you can see that we have a map of the region at right and a bunch of customization features on the left here. And so I'm going to pick an example um, city and kind of walk you through that. And then maybe one of our moderators of the chat, if you want to see your community profile in kind of a live demo, uh, we can walk through another example. And then, of course, you know, invite you all back into this tool on your leisure um, after this webinar to really explore and play around and try to understand these issues for areas that you care about. Um, so let's pick the city of Bloomington. Um, so I'll just type that in. And you can see that Bloomington gets highlighted here. If I zoom in a little bit, um, we can start to to see some patterns here. So the colors on the map range from kind of a uh, orangey to a darker red color. And those are showing the darker red colors are corresponding to areas that are higher priority uh, areas for, you know, greening essentially, or for conservation when we take that lens. So with this environmental justice preset selected, you can see that this um, kind of north East region of Bloomington is a high priority area. Um, if we look at through the lens of conservation, what's popping out, we see a bit different pattern. Um, we can see that this this northern edge of Bloomington, which is part of the 494 corridor, as well as central Bloomington, uh, you know, those areas are high priority associated with a lot of impervious cover and areas where greening could likely help improve some stormwater management um, and reduce the impacts of uh, urban heat islands. Uh, if we look at a conservation preset, we see another pattern still where the western side and also along the, the Minnesota River on the, south, on the south side of Bloomington are really high priority areas. And what's cool is we see that our regional parks are contributing a lot of green space and a lot of value for the tree canopy 
throughout the region. Um, so that's kind of a nice a nice thing here that we see the Highland Bush Anderson Lakes Park is kind of exemplifying here. Um, if we want, we can also start to filter these scores so we can only show high scores or all scores, whatever you want to do there. Um, these these priority scores are on a linear basis, so they can be interpreted um, pretty straightforward there. As we scroll down, let's kind of unpack what's in this report here. So the, the first portion is talking about the tree canopy and how Bloomington or your selected area compares to the region. So here you can see that Bloomington has an existing tree canopy of 40% in 2021. And so this is the tree canopy uh, as of last year. And in this figure, this top part, um, that, that single green dot is the tree canopy cover in Bloomington compared to all communities across the region. And Bloomington does have an above average tree canopy cover, um, but within Bloomington itself, the, the tree cover is not distributed uh, evenly. And so there are some block groups which have very low canopy cover, less than 10%, and are likely in need of some serious greening, and other census block groups which have over 60% tree canopy. And it, in our tool, according to our methods, um, we've kind of identified a goal of 45% 40 tree canopy cover as a, a good target. And you can read in the frequently asked questions section up here at the top about how we arrived at that kind of goal there. Um, as we start to scroll down, there's some information about the prioritization layers and the how the different census block groups um, correspond to the the priority layers there along with some some real data so not these scaled and standardized priority scores but what are the real numbers behind that um, feel free to read the the methods if you want more information about that here's some data on race and income disparities for bloomington and you've seen these figures before showing how tree canopy relates to income and race and uh, what's what's pretty interesting here is that so we saw that kind of global regional pattern, which also plays out across the nation. But we can zoom in further into a single city and see that these patterns hold true at that level as well. So here, all of the census uh, census block groups in Bloomington are highlighted in green. And if we go back to this environmental justice preset. Um, we can see again that this kind of north northeast area of Bloomington is is popping out, and that's going to be driven by these race and income disparities in tree canopy here. Talked about temperature in green space earlier. Again, this pattern that uh, we see at the region wide scale is also plays out at a citywide scale. So here's the relationship between land temperatures and green space for Bloomington. And I'll just quickly note that all of these figures in this report, um, you can drag them and drop them into a PowerPoint. You can kind of see how I've got that opaque uh, figure right there. So if you want to make a case for you know, greening or something like that, you can grab figures right from this in application report. You also have the option to download uh, different formats of a report. So if we download the text report, it'll take just a second here. And then you can see that we've got a HTML file. All that data is in here in this report um, spelled out here. A little bit of information about other resources is also in this report, along with some methodology. You can also download the data in an Excel format. Um, or in a shape file if you wish to map these things yourself. So feel free to explore that. Um, in this tool, we, we've also got a compilation of other resources. Of course, you know, Growing Shade is one of several tools that's designed to help kind of elevate the importance of natural climate solutions, of the tree canopy and urban areas, and uh, how to engage with people. Um, so please, you know, but but that doesn't mean that Growing Shade is the only tool in this space. 
And depending on your needs, there might be something that's actually um, better suited for that. So feel free to peruse those resources. As I mentioned, there's some frequently asked questions. So kind of, um, you know, hopefully we're addressing your concerns there. And then some more detailed methodologies. Um, so I don't, okay, one other thing that I wanna um, just kind of show you about the tool before jumping in to see if there's a, a community section uh, or a suggestion of a community where we can explore this is if we make this map a little bit bigger, you can see that there's a toggle here and zoom in. Um, we can actually see that the tree canopy in 2021 gets layered on top of on top of this map of Bloomington. So in this um, kind of in this high environmental justice priority area, you know, we can uh, toggle off the priority score if we want and flip on to a satellite view. And we can actually see that these are some these are some apartment complexes. And so that might be an you might want to use this type of um, map, take a screenshot of it or something like that to actually be a planting map um, to really be targeted and focused in on where some efforts might um, be concentrated. So that's just a little bit about how you can um, kind of zoom around here and play with the, the base layer that you're seeing, turn the priority scores on and off, and also turn the tree layer on and off here. Um, so I don't know if there's a suggestion of a community that we might like to see demoed live. Um, if not, well, actually, yeah, I'm going to uh, move back to the presentation. We've got another quick example there where we'll actually be looking at the census block group level here. Um, all right, we, here are some suggestions. So let's just do, yeah, let's see Brooklyn Center, if there's anything cool there. So we'll just type in Brooklyn Center there, zoom out. You can see Brooklyn Center has been highlighted in blue, letting us know that's the area where we're at. Let's go ahead and just turn on the tree layer there. Um, oops. So yeah, we can see that we've got some significant green space in this Palmer Lake area, um, as well as, you know, kind of scattered across Brooklyn Center. Uh, if we look at the different presets, you can see that environmental justice, kind of the central area is pretty high priority. Um, what about climate change? Do we see a different pattern there? Okay, slightly different pattern. Um, now, now we're really just getting kind of one census block group that's popping out here. Um, you know, all of these these uh, regional priorities certainly do share some similarities. Um, so that's kind of to be expected from a conservation perspective. All right, so uh, we start to see kind of the area over here. Um, near this lake popping out is maybe the highest priority area there. And, uh, you know, one other cool thing is you could also select your custom priority here. And we could think about what, you know, if you're Brooklyn Center, um, we worked with a, for one of the stories, we interviewed um, a elementary school um, program there, and they were really concerned with uh, like youth and greening, right? So, Maybe if we go to demographics and we want to focus just on um, people, the percent of the population that's under age 18, we can do that. And here we'll combine it with, um, well, we can combine it with tree canopy. We can combine it with um, health metrics or socioeconomic metrics as well. And we can see the patterns that play out and really um, kind of tailor growing shade to our specific needs here and our and the priorities that you've identified with stakeholders and then of course can couple with um, engagement on the ground engagement um, so that's yeah definitely come back to growing shade um, explore it a little bit there's a lot there and yeah so i'm going to switch my screen here again one other final example that i just wanted to share with you is that growing shape can be used to evaluate site level decisions as well. And so here I've 
I've taken a couple aerial images that are a decade apart from uh, this is a, a area in Minneapolis, which is actually where Metro Transit's Haywood campus is located. And these aerial images are showing the construction of a new garage, which added impervious surface to the region and removed about a dozen trees, which I circled in red in the image from 2010. And so, you know, removing a couple trees seems pretty insignificant. But what I find uh, remarkable and shocking is that this census block group has some of the lowest tree canopy cover across the entire region. We're talking less than 2% canopy cover, which is shown in that plot on the right hand screen. And you know, now that growing shade is available to provide this type of information, we hope that it sparks some hard questions when site level decisions are being made. So how could this property have help contribute green space to the region? Are there ways to mitigate the impact of increased impervious surface? And having this type of information, would the development process have occurred any differently? And of course, neither Eric nor I, nor Growing Shade has these answers, but what we do have is a tool that everyone in our region can now use to start asking these questions. So we really challenge you to think about these questions with the land holdings, and um, with areas inside your own cities and um, the decisions that you're making with regards to that land use planning and canopy management and bring these data and these perspectives to those conversations happening. So we hope that Growing Shade helps you understand the need to make places in our region both healthy and resilient and how the tree canopy can help be a part of that. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Eric. Yeah, and I'm just kind of rounding out the presentation here with a couple of uh, high level just things to come. So next slide, please. I will say we know of two communities that are currently using the tool, so that is super exciting. Uh, I think I can name them, St. Louis Park and Hopkins. Um, but we're hoping and encouraging other communities to use the tool because it can really help in decision making and providing that data analysis necessary to justify decisions, right? Um, so we have presented at a, a few different um, venues, uh, and this is our third presentation. We're going to also be presenting at the Minnesota Shade Tree short course. So combination of uh, planning audiences and forestry audiences um, uh, within the month of February and March. Next slide, please. We're also going to do quite a bit of outreach um, in March and April to a more general audience. So a promotional video is going to be uh, going to be delivered and a training video that can take people through the tool. We're also going to pull together people that are using the tool to talk about its application and then train the trainer events. So Ellen and I can't go out and, and visit every single community. There's 188 of them, so that's very challenging. So the idea is that if we can train uh, different users uh, to feel confident with the tool, then they can then train their staff how to use it. Um, so we're going to be having some train the trainer events in April, and then there'll be some media events related to uh, not only Earth Day, but also Arbor Day, which occurs the week following Earth Day. Next slide, please. And we thank you so much for coming. Uh, those are the links to the tool. Um, and we're happy to take any questions. I think we've got 10 minutes, so that's a bit of time left over. So happy to take any questions. Thanks. Yeah, I'll just jump right into some of the questions that I've seen in the chat come up, which I can address. Um, feel free to keep those questions coming in. Um, and then, you know, after we've had a bit of Q&A, we'll, as promised, show and share with you the answers to those trivia questions. Um, so one of the first questions that we got here is how do we reconcile existing eco regions which do not have large amounts of tree cover with the proposed strategies of planting new trees and increasing the canopy cover as a solution to uh, negative environmental impacts and yeah specifically with an eye to prairies so yeah prairie is one of the most endangered habitats in minnesota um, and absolutely per like preserving and conserving existing prairie is um, a huge priority. How uh, one thing that we did um, in Growing Shade to come up with that 45% tree canopy cover goal was look at the existing vegetation 
in the um, 1800s, so using some data from the uh, generalized land survey. Again, that's in the methods or in the frequently asked questions. I spelled that out a bit more, so feel free to uh, jump into that. Certainly in some areas, there is more tree cover now than what existed kind of pre-settlement era. Um, and I think one thing that's really, at least I think is really critical to keep in mind is that, you know, I don't think that anyone would advocate for, um, or, or certainly we know that right now we live in a very um, changed landscape, changed by uh, humans. You know, we've left just an incredible footprint on land use uh, in the last 100 years, in the last, you know, 50 years, in particular, as a lot of development has occurred in the Twin Cities region um, specifically. And I think that, uh, you know, thinking about what the historic land cover was certainly provides us a really good grounding point for what the types of ecosystem services we might want to be considering are. Um, but also, you know, kind of reconciling that with the fact that in a really urban environment or even suburbanized environment, you know, what what are the challenges and ecosystem services that we should be thinking about given the existing land use today? So definitely a bit of an art and science there, um, thinking about how, how land and land cover has changed over, you know, the course of centuries really, um, and and how planning influence can help shape the trajectories moving forward as well. Um, more questions in the chat here. Uh, one quick question is what are the factors used in prioritization for climate change? So um, if you ever forget these, definitely jump back into the tool um, in the stories part, uh, that, that first home landing section. If you scroll down to the taking action, um, we lay that out. Um, but in for the climate change lens, we're really thinking about extreme heat and altered precipitation patterns, so the risk of localized flooding. So those are the two layers there. Maybe I can address the next question about um, inventorying of, of city ordinances related to tree planting. Um, part of the reason I, I embarked on this journey is because I'm responsible, or partly responsible for the creation of the extreme heat map. And just seeing that relation between land use and extreme heat made, reminded me of my time working as a city planner and the, the very low uh, landscaping requirements for commercial industrial uses in our city. Um, so I think in answer to that question, well, we have not inventoried tree ordinances, but I think that this provides a good opportunity for cities to maybe revisit um, some of those landscaping requirements for various land uses. Um, and the other question about um, like HOAs and townhouse development and people not having necessarily control over the land. Uh, well, I think that one thing that's interesting is that um, cities like St. Louis Park, a good example, like using the data from this tool, they've actually been able to provide incentives for certain private landowners to actually plant trees at reduced cost um, based on the prioritization using the tool. So it may not be that, um, you know, it, landowners are difficult sometimes to approach in this case, but if you're providing incentives on private land, um, you know, in particular locations, looking at particular variables, then there might be opportunities in some of these um, HOA areas to enhance the tree canopy, sort of like St. Louis Park's approach. I hope that kind of answers that question. There's another question in the chat about tree species, um, thinking about edible landscapes. And yeah, I think that's a really important question, or it, it broaches the topic of biodiversity and of species of trees, right? Um, you know, I guess Growing Shade isn't making any type of statement on biodiversity. The data on that are a bit, um, well, it's, it's hard to get up-to-date data in the way that we've really chosen to prioritize that temporal accuracy. So thinking about what is the tree canopy cover in 2021? Um, you know, I I think that the stakeholder engagement piece of that, uh, that we 
emphasize in Growing Shade is um, maybe provides a roadmap for answering that question, um, specifically the lesson from Detroit, Michigan, where engaging people on the ground, thinking about what their concerns are, what their preferences and priorities are, particularly around tree species or what type of ecosystem services they're looking for um, or would be happy to to have in their their area would be really critical there. Um, Eric, do you think that we should switch over to the trivia answers or um, is there time for another question? I think we could put the trivia answers up and and I think that there might even be a, a link to those answers also, which we can maybe throw in the chat. Um, but there's some good questions still coming in. Um, let's see here. I'd be curious to know how close people were to their, to their answers. Um, but yeah, the, the the interesting thing, honestly, for me, this tool is so critical because we've never had more or less real time canopy data. And to get at that percentage of where communities are at with existing tree cover will be absolutely critical to combating things like emerald ash borer. Um, one thing that Ellen found looking at the data generated by this tool and comparing it to some more static data from 2015 is that she could actually see the difference between 2015 and 2021 in terms of what emerald ash borer had, you know, the effect that that had caused in our region in terms of tree loss. So I think having this current data is going to be absolutely critical in that sort of fight. There's a, there's a question here. Let's just see here. Is there any broader programmatic effort to help communities reduce barriers and potentially enhance development review process for canopy expansion? I'm thinking a tree or landscape version of the small soul, soul smart program. That's that's a great question. I don't think we've really explored that much, um, but I think that there is uh, certainly scope for something like that. Um, it may not be in the form of grants, although that's something I would be interested in providing. I, I don't know. We'd have to figure out how to do that. But then also the technical resources available for a program like SoulSmart, like 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 model ordinances could be something that could come off the back of this tool that would be really helpful for communities, I would think. And I think we're coming up to 1, 1, 1 p.m. So I think that there is a, an opportunity for you to complete an evaluation. Uh, that would be super helpful for us to help inform us how to uh, keep these events relevant and keep them um, interesting and um, helpful for your for your career development. So, um, you know, we want to we want to stay on the cutting edge of making sure um, we're providing good technical resources to you all. Um, so if you can complete that survey, that would be excellent. But thank you all for your time today, and uh, we really appreciated you. And please share the tool wild, wi widely. Thanks.